Hey, welcome back to the InterAxis uh, YouTube channel and InterAxis.io. Uh, we've talked a lot about um, cus custodial systems, custody. We talked about wallets. We're going to talk about exchanges uh, in this video. Specifically in this one, we're going to start with the centralized exchanges before we move on to decentralized exchanges. So where did centralized exchanges come from? Uh, well, let's go back to our example, right? Adam, let's say, has 100 shares of GE stock, and Ron over here does not at the moment. So let's say back in the day, Adam wanted to sell his 100 shares of GE stock to Ron. Well, the first question is, how much is Ron going to pay for the GE stock? Uh, and they have to agree to some number. So let's say they agree that Ron is going to pay $10 for every share of GE stock. So Adam and Ron have to find a place to meet up. Uh, Adam has to bring his 100 shares, remember pieces of paper, stock certificates to Ron, and he'll deliver them the stock certificates. And Ron will deliver Adam $10 per share, which is $1,000, whether it be cash, check, whatever it might be. And then Adam would transfer those shares to Ron. Now the way he would do it in the old days is Adam would sign the back of the stock certificate and transfer, sign them over to Ron. Now, in addition, Adam and Ron have to notify GE or the transfer agent that Ron is now the owner so that GE can send Ron information, can send him dividends, can ask him about voting and such. So they have to let GE or, or later the transfer agent know. Now this is what we call a peer-to-peer -peer transfer of stock. Um, and at one point this might have been viable, but of course, as we've said before, this relationship and this transaction does not scale. If you have millions and millions of people who own stock and millions and millions of people who, who want to buy it, this transaction obviously doesn't work. It's not safe, it's not secure, uh, it's not efficient, none of those things. So you then develop markets, you, you, you develop exchanges, right? An exchange would be some sort of central point. Where can everyone go that has stock that wants to sell and the people that, that have stock or have money that they want to buy stock, right? So you create an exchange. It's no different than some sort of uh, marketplace, bazaar, whatever you might have had where you can exchange goods, um, uh, agricultural products, things people have made, whatever. So it's basically a store, but it's a place where Adam and Ron's of the world can meet and actually exchange stock. And what happens is on the exchange, you have what's called an order book. So you'll probably hear of the order book. And the order book is basically a listing of all the people who, who want to, in this case, sell stock and all the people who want to buy stock. Okay, and the people on the buy are called the bid and the people on the sell are called the ask. The bid is here's how much I will bid or buy this stock for and the sell people say here's how much I will sell or here's how much I will ask for my stock. Okay, and the sellers are obviously trying to get as much as they can and the buyers are trying to buy for the lowest price that they can. And this creates the order book. When you consolidate all these people, you have an order book. And when you have an agreement, when your sell price equals your buy price, the, the, when the highest sell price equals the, no, when the highest buy price equals the lowest sell price at the time, that is the current market price. Okay, because that's the price at which someone is willing to sell and someone else is willing to buy and money can change hands. Now, this seems like it, it might all be simple, but the problem here is what if you don't have enough buyers for all the people that want to sell at a certain price? Or what if you don't have enough sellers for all the people that want to buy at a certain price? Well, these exchanges create someone called a market maker. Okay, and what the market maker's job is, the market maker's job is to basically create the market. So the market maker will see all the people that want to buy at certain prices and the market maker will jump in here if there are no sellers and the market maker will buy here. 
and the market maker will well the market maker will sell here and the market maker will buy here okay because these people need to be able to sell their stock at some point and these people need to be able to buy the market makers job is to provide that market if there isn't one on the other side this the exchange and the market maker is what makes this essentially a centralized market. A centralized market might be the New York Stock Exchange, it might be NASDAQ, okay, but it's a place that buyers and sellers can come together and make sure that they can exchange their, their stock, their equities, this could be commodities, this could be bonds, whatever it might be, they can exchange them use the laws of supply and demand to create a price. And on top of that, there's the market maker. The market maker is there to assist with liquidity. Okay, so let's give a, for instance, a situation where the, the price of stock is falling. So the, let's say the price of this GE stock is falling, falling, falling. There might not be people that want to buy it at that moment, at this particular price. Someone has to step in and start buying from these people that want to sell on the way down so that this doesn't get all the way down to zero or, or a dollar or something before someone will buy it. So the market maker is there to provide some level of liquidity. Now to go back to why the exchange is created and why the market maker was, cre was, was created is in to, to to have these public markets, to have the, um, the economies that we do, the free market economy, you have to have people that are willing to invest in companies like GE, in, in public companies. Now for me to put my money in here, I have to feel pretty confident, one, that GE is a good company is going to, uh, going to deliver a profit to me. But I also have to feel comfortable that if I need to get out of this, that I can get out of this stock. Well, to do that, I obviously can't rely on the peer-to-peer -peer system to transfer my stock to someone, so I know that there's a market. This is great. There's an exchange where I can go and sell my stock if I need to. So what you've added is security and ease of use, right? I can easily go sell my stock in an exchange. So I feel comfortable investing in GE from the, from the get-go. They're a solid company, that's fine, I want my dividends, but if I need to get my money out, I can get my money out in the exchange. Even more so, you have market makers here. So I know I don't have to wait for someone on the other side to come in and want to buy it. I can sell it at any moment. This market maker will buy it from me. They'll keep it in their own inventory until such case as someone over here is willing to buy it from them. Okay, so the market maker creates liquidity. Liquidity is extremely important in the public markets because I don't feel comfortable enough buying the stock unless I know I can get out of it. And I know there's an exchange. The exchange provides me uh, some level of ease of use, right? It's easy to go to an exchange. There's some security here, right? Because we already have a, a system um, where there, there's a transfer agent. I don't have to physically carry my stock certificates. The transfer agent is keeping track because the exchange tells the transfer agent what happens when, when stock is, is exchanged here. All right, there's an efficiency because the exchange is creating this order book. It's creating the buys and the sells, the people who want to buy at a certain price and the ones who sell, pairing us up so it gets what is actually the best market price based on the supply and demand at the time, and it's providing liquidity via the market maker. And the market maker is obligated by a regulation to make the market. They have to buy where the sells are and sell where the buys are. And they have to do it always. Even if the, if the price is falling or the price is shooting up, they have to be there and ready to jump in and make that market and keep that stock in their inventory. So because of all that, I can feel comfortable buying the security initially because I know that I can easily and safely, efficiently get out of this at, at a certain price um, and there's going to be the liquidity there that if I need the money or I'm scared and this price is falling and I need to get out, I can get out. And this is partially, the centralized exchange is partially what makes the economy go because without this, 
no one would ever want to invest in public companies if they weren't able to ever get out. Now, of course, this could be public companies, this could be bonds, this could be commodities, whatever it is, this centralized exchange uh, takes over. Now, where does the exchange make money? Well, there's a difference in price usually between the buy and the sell, right? The buys are trying to get it at the lowest possible price. The sells are trying to sell it at the uh, highest possible price. So the spread here is usually where the, the exchange and where the market maker makes all their money, right? So if they buy the GE stock, if, he, if, he buy, if, if the market maker buys the GE stock for $9.95 and sells it over here for $10, right, he makes five cents on every share. Now that might not seem like a lot, but there are millions and millions of shares traded every day. So millions and millions of shares times five cents is a really big deal. So the market maker makes their money on the spread. So this, this number isn't always going to, going to match up exactly. There's going to be a spread in here, and the spread is where the market maker and the exchange make their money. That is a centralized exchange. The rules and regulations in the order book are managed by a centralized entity. In this case, it could be the New York Stock Exchange, it could be NASDAQ. Okay, when we, when we start looking at the digital and crypto world, right, this exchange could be Binance, okay? It could be Coinbase, right? It's still a centralized exchange. It still has an order book. This, instead of GE, could now be Bitcoin, right? The difference here with the centralized exchange uh, with, with, for instance, Binance is you don't necessarily have a market maker. Okay? You have to have, your, your liquidity is only there because there are other people on this side that want to buy what you have to sell. So if I have one Bitcoin that I want to sell, there has to be someone willing to buy it at a certain price. I put in my order and I might put in here's the price I will sell it at and I will not sell it at any price below that, and there has to be someone willing to buy it from me at that price, but it's still a centralized exchange. Binance is still running the order book, and Binance still can make money on the transaction fees, and they can still choose to make money on the spread. So that, that's the, the different, that, that's what a centralized exchange is. Coinbase is the same way. You can go onto Coinbase and buy and sell uh, cryptocurrency, you can go on a Coinbase Pro and be trading cryptocurrency, and it's, an, it's a centralized exchange. They're, they're managing the order book, and they're managing um, the, the people that can come in and sell and buy. The difference, as we talked about earlier, when we talked about wallets and, and custody, is in Binance and Coinbase, if I put my one Bitcoin in here, and I want to go sell it, I don't technically own this Bitcoin. This is in the wallet of Binance. So, so Binance has a, a large wallet and they've allocated, they've, told, they, they've, it, they've made an accounting entry that I have one Bitcoin and I have the ability to sell that one Bitcoin. And if I ever want to move my Bitcoin out of Binance, I can request to move it to another wallet. Okay, and there's going to be a fee involved in that because Binance is going to have to take it out of their huge wallet full of Bitcoin and send it to my personal Bitcoin wallet. So the, the difference is Binance can, you know, for, from a security standpoint, they could potentially theoretically get hacked, which they have been hacked. And someone could, could decide to move all the, the Bitcoin that's in the Binance wallet into their own wallet and mine might be gone. Now Binance and Coinbase and such, they have insurance policies, they have tons of security to govern this, um, and obviously they want to stay in business, right? They, they, don't, they don't want anything like that to happen, so even if they do get hacked, and even if some Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrencies are taken or moved to another wallet outside of their control, they're probably going to make you whole um, it, at some level so that they don't lose a bunch of business, okay? But when you start talking about smaller exchanges that might not have that much money, might not have the insurance and the security, 
they get hacked one time, they might be gone. Okay, the, the other issue, the other thing to look out for with Coinbase and Binance and some of the larger exchanges is they provide so much more liquidity. Remember, we, we had the market maker here in the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and stuff. Coinbase and Binance don't have a market maker to provide liquidity. What you need for liquidity is you need, if you're a seller, you need enough people on the buy side to know that you can get out at a certain price. Now the problem has been sometimes is, as we all know with cryptocurrency, they can be extremely volatile. So if the price starts falling really fast, there might not be buyers at the price you want to sell. And you might have to keep lowering and lowering and lowering your price and put in a market order. A market order means I will sell for whatever price someone is willing to buy. I'm not going to be picky right now. I just need to get out. A market order on the buy side, if Bitcoin is shooting up, is I'm just going to buy for whatever price. I don't care. I just want to get it before it, it shoots up. Okay, so um, the, the reason why you want to go with some of the, potentially the bigger centralized exchanges in this case are they are going to have more liquidity by virtue of the fact that they have more people trying to buy and sell at any particular time. And the more people and the more uh, cryptocurrencies that are in there are, are what's going to provide that level of liquidity. Some of the smaller cryptocurrencies, the, the less traded ones, uh, for instance in Binance or Bittrex or some of the others, might not have that level of liquidity. So if you're a whale and you're going in there trying to trade five Bitcoin worth of some small token, you might not be able to, to make enough trades to, to do what you want because there's not enough sellers on the other side when you're looking to buy. And when you're looking to sell, there's not enough buyers on the other side, which means there's not enough liquidity. So what you have to say is, am I willing, am I open to getting into that particular cryptocurrency, knowing full well there might not be enough liquidity on the other side? So that is what a, th those are centralized exchanges. We start for centralized exchanges um, in, in the traditional world, it might be the New York Stock Exchange, it might be NASDAQ, you have the, the commodities exchanges, you have all sorts of other centralized exchanges that are controlling the order book and the market makers. In the crypto world, we have Coinbase and Binance, um, Bittrex and, and, and Bitfinex and several other uh, centralized exchanges. Uh, so in the next video, what we'll talk about is decentralized exchanges. So subscribe to the YouTube channel, check us out at interaxis.io.